Welcome to another episode of It's Always Game Day in Buffalo. Matt Bove, joined as always by Sal Capaccio, Bills beat reporter and sideline reporter for WGR. I'm over with Channel 7. Sal, do you remember, I don't know the episode it was, a few weeks ago I was talking about Puna Ford on the podcast. We didn't even know if he was signed with the Seahawks. We were looking it up as the podcast was going on. We were like, we don't know. Well, maybe I manifested this into happening. The Puna Ford coming to Buffalo. One-year deal. I love the move. I think it makes a ton of sense for them, Sale. I, I do too. Um, so I, I need to get you one of these coffee mugs. See this right here? It, it's yeah. gonna say, it's gonna say uh, because I'm a Bove, not because I'm a Capaccio, because you were right. You were talking about Puna Ford. Um, in case you can't in case you're on the audio version, my brother got me a, something of a coffee mug for Christmas. It says, Of course I'm right, I'm a Capaccio. It's right there on the video, but that's you. You were right, you're a Bove, you were right about Puna Ford, but um, it was a great call by you to kind of bring him up. I know he'd been talked about in other, you know, Bills fans circles. Um, I, I had mentioned it before. I just never thought it was really going to happen because it always seemed like he was earmarked to go back to the Seattle Seahawks. So mm-hmm. what do we know about Puna Ford? Um, he is an undersized as far as height defensive yeah. tackle, but not as far as weight 305, 310. He's an anchor. He can be right in the middle of your defense. He's really known more in his career as a run stopper, but he became a better pass rusher as his career went on. He came into the uh, Seahawks in 2018 as an undrafted free agent. And really in 2021, he started to show a lot of promise, even as a penetrating pass rusher. But what happened was Matt, they flipped defenses from a four, three to a three, four, and they didn't really know how to use them last year. And he didn't have a great year. His numbers were good. He had three sacks, but he didn't have the year he had the year before. And I think that's what kind of, maybe dinged him as far as the free agent process was concerned. And he didn't maybe get the deal he wanted. He was still a free agent, but this is a guy going back to a four, three in Buffalo where he doesn't have to be a two gap defensive tackle. He doesn't have to hold down two players in two gaps as a three, four lineman. He can be in a four, three and he can basically be one gap guy and he can penetrate and he can be really good against the run to help out those backers. Yeah, and when you talk about the evaluation, that was another reason why we never really knew if this was going to happen because if you looked on Spot Track, he had a $9.2 million evaluation for his yearly contract that he was going to sign. We don't exactly know the details yet, but it certainly is not anywhere close to 9.2. And the reports out there from NFL Network were that he wanted to come play for a Super Bowl contender, which is why he wanted to play for the Bills. And listen, I know defensive tackle, this doesn't figure out and fix their problems long term because it's just another one year contract, but it's another body that can be in a rotation who's probably going to play a very prominent role within that rotation. And he's only 27 years old. So if he comes here and he checks all of the boxes that you wanted him to check, there's no reason that he couldn't stick around and be part of the core moving forward. I think of it a little bit like Taylor Rapp. Like Taylor Rapp is coming here to get on the field, but also to probably play himself into a more prominent role down the road. And I kind of think Puna Ford is in that same boat, that if he could come here and if you see more from him than maybe you see from a couple of the other defensive tackles, maybe then you go, okay, guess what? Our future defensive tackle is going to be at Oliver, Puna Ford, and Daquan Jones for a couple more years. Or it's, you know, some other variation of the people that are under on the last year of these one-year contracts. So I really like the move because I think it gives them a type of player that they didn't currently have, and it lets them really lean into that rotation that they strive for. It's also depth. It's also really important depth. Look at the game against the Bengals when they didn't have Daquan Jones. It was very obvious that they were getting bullied at that line of scrimmage. This helps that. Yeah, isn't it funny how a couple weeks ago we had the GM himself saying if there's one spot where we're light beyond 2023 contractually, it's defensive tackle. So we all basically thought they're going to kind of set themselves up a little bit for the future at defensive tackle, draft somebody. They never drafted anybody. They still have everybody on a one-year deal, seven guys, and then they sign another one in Puna Ford save eight guys under contract all on one year deals. And it just seems like Brandon Bean, even though he said that Matt didn't force the issue, which I, which I like, they didn't say we have to get a defensive tackle. They said, Hey, if it happens, it happens. And we can maybe help ourselves for the future, but now you'll just kind of figure it out. And honestly, like some of these guys will be extended anyway. I think maybe Tim settled, maybe Daquan Jones, like you said, who knows about Ed Oliver. It's not trending that way. But if you look at the defensive tackle spot now, I don't know, Matt. Like, this is interesting. Does this come down to Puna Ford against Jordan Phillips for a, a roster spot? Because they've kept five. They can. 
And maybe they do, but traditionally they keep four defensive tackles and they do rotate. But I would say five of them could be likely here. But if you're coming down to four, this is some serious competition. I don't think there's any way Puna Ford is coming to this team unless he knows for sure he's making the roster. I think he could even go and, you know, get banged up or have a bad training camp. Like he's still going to be on the 53 man roster. So I would say I'm trending towards them keeping five. But that also brings us to a really interesting kind of conversation of well, what other positions or where, where are you going to take one player from if you're going to keep that extra defensive tackle? And one of those positions is running back, which also became that much more interesting really this week with the addition of Latavius Murray. Cause I don't think he's quite to the level that Puna Ford is like locked to make the roster, but I still, I don't think Latavius Murray is coming here and signing like Duke Johnson did last year as just a flyer. And you'll see what happens. Like I think Latavius Murray, it seems like probably had some interest elsewhere and given his production last year, it looks like he can still play. So I'm not saying that he's a lock to make the team, but I think he will. Latavius, that is. Yes. It's interesting. My co-host, Joe DiBiase, and I did a projected 53-man roster um, the day after they signed Latavius, but before we knew they signed Puna Ford, and we didn't even have Puna Ford on the list because he wasn't there yet, and obviously we would probably both put him on. And it's a fun exercise to do because, A, you realize how good this roster still really is, right, Matt? Like, they still are very good. They are very deep. But it came down to us for the last spot between Latavius Murray and Cam Lewis. And I don't disagree with you. I think it's hard for me to keep Latavius Murray off this roster. I think it's a numbers game, though. So what I do see could possibly happen here is I don't think Latavius Murray, if you release him at the end of training camp, is going to go somewhere else. You can pretty easily get him on the practice squad. You know what I mean? Like, I think that can happen. Whereas a guy like, for example, Cam Lewis, a younger guy in your system, Like, that's the kind of guy. Now, he wouldn't be subject to waivers. I think he's been in the league four years now. But those are the kind of guys that maybe another team says, you know, we'll give you a better opportunity. So what I could see happening is a guy like Latavius gets released, resigns to the practice squad because it's so big now and they can have all these veterans now. And then you just elevate him when you need. He's your Duke Johnson, essentially, from last year. And he becomes a by game decision. And if you need him one game, you elevate him. You need another game, you elevate him. Eventually you may have to put him on the 53 man roster, but it's not a pressing need. I, I don't disagree that he's sitting right there and he looks like a real good fit to be on the 53, but I also don't think there's much risk in saying, Hey, we'll kind of stash on the practice squad and bring it up when needed, because he seems to me to just fit, fit a specific role. They're looking for short yardage, bigger back, something that They struggled with last year. I know they signed Damian Harris, but Damian Harris isn't Latavius Murray. Damian Harris is 5'11". He's Mm -hmm. got some power. He's a physical runner. He's got some speed. Latavius Murray, to me, is we have this guy for certain situations, and I don't know as a 33-year-old how much you can justify every single game getting a jersey for that. It's tough, and I hear what you're saying, but I think Latavius Murray is a lot closer to being – a legitimate option for their offense than Duke Johnson ever was last year. I mean, Latavius Murray had 700 yards in 12 games last year with the Broncos. It is not like that was an absolute unit of a team and he was just getting garbage yards. Like he was playing. He was the number two guy, right? Wouldn't he be the number three guy here? I guess it kind of depends on what they think of the running back position, what they think of James Cook, what they think Damian Harris is going to be for them. I've said on the podcast before, I think there's a route for Damian Harris to be the Bills' number one running back this year, and James Cook still continues to kind of be utilized less than people want him to be. So it really just depends on that. It depends on James Cook. Damian Harris has also had health issues. That's a reason why he was probably even available in the first place, because he's had some years where he gets banged up and he doesn't play a ton of games. Latavius Murray is a little bit of an insurance piece for that. It's interesting. Whether, but whether it's one or two or two and one with Cook and Harris, Latavius is three, right? Well, then you go to Naheem Hines, probably. Right. Yeah. So, so I guess this is my issue. How, how do you how do you keep them all at that position? Now, look, they kept four last year because Taiwan was strictly for special teams. I could mm-hmm. see it this way. Naheem Hines is your Taiwan Jones. He's just a different special teams guy. He's a returner, not a gunner. But mm-hmm. – that's how I think that's the path I think Latavius has to be on. But to me, it's just about numbers. I don't know how you can because Naeem Hines is is playing. James yes. Cook is playing. The Damian Harris is playing. Reggie Gilliam factors into this, right? I just 
I don't know where how you have enough for these numbers. It's a good problem to have, and yeah. I think Latavius Murray is a good player to have on the roster. I just wonder how it all shakes out in the end. Then I think you go to the wide receivers, which is the natural, or even to the tight ends, and see who is going to be actually active on game day. So, like, here are the wide receivers that are definitely going to make the team. It's Stephon Diggs, it's Gabe Davis, it's Trent Sherfield, it's Deontay Hardy, and then after that, am I missing anybody? Yes, my Khalil Shakir. Oh, Khalil Shakir. Okay, so those are the five that I would say, okay, they're definitely making the team. Yep. And I think Justin Shorter will, based off of what Brandon Bean said about him. But Agreed. I don't think you need to have more than five of those guys active on any given day. And at tight end, I know he made it last year. Are we saying it's rock solid, a lock that Quentin Morris is making this team? No, no, I didn't have him on my 53 projection. In fact, I will tell you, on the 53 projection that I did with, with Joe, that was one of the biggest pushbacks that I got was, well, wait a minute. Dalton Kincaid is not a traditional tight end. And if mm-hmm. you're going to run these this 12 personnel, you got to have another tight end. So therefore, it's Quentin Morris. I don't know if that's true, because to me, if Dalton Kincaid is on the field for what, 50 percent of the snaps, I think that's reasonable. Dawson mm-hmm. Knox is playing quite a bit. Where does the other tight end even fit into play? Quentin Morris can play special teams, but at some point you have to cut it off and say, You just can't have that many people. There's not enough spots. Yeah, so that's the thing that I always come back to. It's like, if you're going to keep three tight ends on your 53-man roster, then I don't know how you keep four running backs and six wide receivers. The math just becomes way too complicated at that point. The only thing that makes it a little bit more feasible is, like you said, there's not a Taiwan Jones in the running back room who's active on game days just for strictly special teams. And I don't know exactly how you replace that role you use Naheem Hines as your punt returner. I think the real, I think it's, I think it's Justin Shorter is how you replace it. What you just said. I think that's why he makes it. That's a good point. That's interesting. But I also don't even know if Naheem Hines is going to strictly be, because you also have Deontay Hardy. Like Deontay Hardy was an all pro a couple of years ago as a returner. Do you separate the responsibilities? Is Hines do punts and Hardy does kicks or vice versa? Hines does kicks and Hardy does punts. I don't know exactly what they want to do. It does give them though, the luxury of having a couple options because in years past, it's just like roll Micah Hyde out there. And then last year, Micah Hyde was not available, which became a little bit of a concern. Like those punts would be in the air and you would be like, "Eh, I don't know if they're going to make the catch and just do something and not be dumb. Well, I think we have to go back to something Brandon Bean said when they, when they signed Sherfield, he said, we see him as a number four receiver. I think they, I think Hines is your primary return man because he's not going to be expected to be one of your top two running backs, whereas Sherfield is one of your top four wide receivers. He said he's our number four. So I think that gets me more to Hines becoming the main guy, but Sherfield's certainly somebody that you can rely on if you need to. You know, you never hope it happens, but injuries do happen. So he's right there as well. I think it's super interesting how all of this shapes up. And again, I'll go back to, I think at the end of the day, If you do this exercise, you look at the Bills 53, you have to make some tough decisions. And one thing that stands out, Matt, is they're still a really good roster. Like this, the back end of this roster is still way better than most teams back end. Yeah. I mean, look at the players that we're talking about potentially battling for roster spots. I mean, I I don't think this is the case, but we were just saying Puna Ford and Jordan Phillips. Then we were talking about Quentin Morris. Then we were talking about Latavius Murray. These are guys who could walk on to a lot of other teams and probably play significant snaps, let alone just be on their roster. I do think there are a couple spots where they're still a bit thin, and that's a bit concerning for me. I would say linebacker is probably top of mind, and it's not necessarily thin from a number standpoint. It's thin from just a experience and starting standpoint, because besides Matt Milano, there are still a lot of questions with all of those other guys, and somebody, one of them is going to be on the field. So, I guess the concern going into the offseason, into mini camp, into training camp is even if one of those guys solidifies their spot as a starter, what does the depth behind them look like if something happens? Or what if something happens to Matt Milano? Because then you're rolling out two linebackers who probably would not have been on the field in any other circumstance last year. And I don't know who you feel the most comfortable about. I mean, I don't even know. Who's the leader in the clubhouse right now? Is it Dodson? Is it Bernard? Didn't Bean mention Dodson as 
literally that the leader in the clubhouse, like after the, after the draft, I don't know how, how much that's, you know, stock that is because he's just, he's more of a veteran guy. He's got the experience. Maybe that's why it happens. I'm glad you brought this up though. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about the linebackers because this really fits perfectly into something Brandon Bean said this week that maybe might give us some clues. Sal Capaccio, Matt Bove. It's always game day in Buffalo. Thanks for listening, subscribing, downloading great numbers lately. Matt, can we just say thank you to everybody who's come along lately and given us, um, you know, their, yeah. their, their ear, you know, I guess. Uh, we really appreciate eyes. it. You know, it's video. We're putting it on YouTube now at Sal Sports on YouTube, but we want you to download and subscribe. But we've had a lot of great feedback. The Mike North episode was real good. We'll talk about the schedule here a little bit, but thank you so much, everybody. It's really, really means a lot to us. We've tried to grow this. It's been a year now that we've been mm-hmm. doing this. I think that, you know, um, Fans are starting to settle in to know where to find us and what we're all about here. So we appreciate that. So you said it's thin at linebacker. And I was thinking in my head, yes, literally thin. Like they have Quite thin, thin linebackers, yes. right? They, these guys are, are not the biggest linebackers in the world, especially for Mike linebackers. But I think we're seeing a shift in what the Bills want to do. We have a different play caller, Sean McDermott, who's essentially the defensive coordinator now. And I think we're going away from, and they are, the, you know, the, the role that, Tremaine Edmonds played and, and granted he was a sideline to sideline guy, but this really rangy, bigger linebacker to something a little smaller who can even be better in coverage. And I'll tell you why. Yeah. So I don't know if you heard the interview Chris Long did, I did. with Brandon Bean on the green light podcast. You heard it, right? I tweeted I out did, some yes. video. I thought it was super interesting where in one of the questions and segments Bean said straight up, sometimes it was a tougher matchup for a guy like Tremaine against, you know, certain tight ends or running backs or certain personnel slot receivers. He mentioned and how he wasn't able to cover them because of his size. And he's so good at these other things, but this was a matchup issue. And he said, it's a matchup league. They met Milano. who could do all these different things. And he said, we kind of want a guy who is I'm paraphrasing here who can really be good enough against the run, but can really help in coverage as well. I think we're seeing a shift here, Matt, to little lighter, smaller middle linebackers who they they're fearless. They can do all of it against the run. And now you have Puna Ford up there. You have Daquan Jones up there to maybe tie those guys up, but really guys who are going to be better in coverage to go against the Travis Kelsey's of the world, to go against the Tyler Boyd's of the world in the slot guys like that. And I think that's what the bills are shifting to. And whether that's, Terrell Bernard or Dorian Williams, Tyrell Dodson, not as much, but still kind of in that mold. I can see it. And I'll even throw this on top of it. I think we might see a team here in the Bills who go a little bit more away from nickel than they've played the last several years because Taron Johnson being in the box as late as he was, teams took advantage of that against the run. Could we see maybe, maybe a more big nickel look from this defense with Taylor Rapp or with one of these other linebackers on the field along with the other two? Well, it's an interesting idea because then you're keeping somebody off of the field who has played a pretty prominent role for this defense for the last couple of years. And if you think that that's something that ultimately benefits you, then you have no hesitations doing it because you're not thinking about one or two players. You're thinking about just the greater good of the unit. When you were talking about the Brandon Bean, Tremaine Edmonds comments, I also heard them. There was one play in particular I thought of, and I don't think you can ever really put any one play on one player. I think there's so much that goes into almost everything that happens on a football field. But I thought of the walk-off touchdown in Tampa Bay with Rashad Perryman and Tremaine Edmonds out in coverage. And it looked like Dane Jackson had a screw up on that play too. And we didn't really know who was supposed to have who, but I just remember the middle of the fields, that route and just being like, yeah, there's no way that he can keep up with that guy. And it led to the game winning touchdown in overtime. So that's what I immediately thought back to. I think though, it is important to say, even though, this might benefit them in a few areas. I still think it's a net negative. Like I do not think they are as good of a team without Tremaine Edmonds. I think they will miss Tremaine Edmonds. And I think there will be growing pains there. They might be able to defend certain things better, but I think they will struggle with more of those than they'll ultimately benefit from. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Dorian Williams eventually turns into Tremaine Edmonds in a year or two, and he looks like an absolute stud. Or maybe Bernard or Spectre or Dodson steps right in and immediately plays to not the level of Edmonds, but close or closer than we think to the level of Edmonds. And you go, okay, wow, like they made the right call letting him walk. That was way too much money. 
I still think, though, you would feel much more comfortable about the defense if Edmonds was there again for this year. But you also would not have had a situation where you had Edmonds and Poyer. It always felt like it was one or the other. And even with Poyer getting way less money than we thought he was going to, I, I just don't see any scenario where they were both back. It really is interesting how you talked about all that because I agree with you. And there's no doubt, like, I don't want to come off as I'm even saying that, like, they're better off without Tremaine Edmonds. Even I think Brandon Bean would love Tremaine Edmonds on the team. Mm -hmm. But I think for what they're saying and how much he got paid, $18 million a year, they just couldn't do it. They they couldn't justify it. And they want to go to a little bit of a shift here. But it's really interesting you say about Poyer and Edmonds. And I think about the addition of Taylor Rapp. And I, I do wonder, in a way, if – is it any sort of insurance against Micah Hyde and his injury? Is it any sort of insurance against, hey, just in case Micah doesn't get to fully health, full health and, you know, the neck injury, it's always something you have to kind of have in the back of your head. You know, they have a guy here. Or is it, no, no, we have plans to have these three guys on the field a lot because I think that's a really key signing to some clues about what Brandon Bean, I'm sorry, what Sean McDermott wants to do with the defense. And the other part of this is I went back and watched some stuff from last year. In particular, I actually watched a little bit of the um, the last two Miami games, the one that was at home at the end of the year where they won the division, and then the one where, um, or the, at least made the playoffs, and then the playoff game. Two things stood out. Number one, this whole point I was talking about before, Miami actually schemed up, Matt. They did a great job of scheming up motion to get Matt Milano out of the box and Taron Johnson in the box, and they took advantage of that. Like, and I look at that and I go, that's something the Bills are probably saying. We can't let that happen. Like, if teams do that, we got to have a little bit of a better alternative. So as much as you're right, Taron Johnson's a fantastic player. Teams took advantage of having him as their extra guy to defend the run, and that's why Miami had success running. The other thing that really stood out, honestly, and we all love the story, boy, DeMar Hamlin was just late on a lot of stuff, Matt. He was just really late. And I kept saying, if Micah Hyde is on the field, that doesn't happen. The play to Jalen Waddle doesn't happen. The touchdown to Tyree Kill doesn't happen. I think the addition and health of Micah Hyde is maybe the best and biggest addition to this team in 2023. Well, it goes back to they would be a better team with Tremaine Edmonds on the field. But I think they will be a better defense out of the gate than they were last year because of a healthy Micah Hyde and eventually a healthy Von Miller. We really didn't see a full game of a healthy Bills defense besides the season opener That's where right. they held the Super Bowl champs to 13 points. That's so right. that is what I think of when you think of actually fully healthy personnel. And then after that, then you have the Micah Hyde injury against the Titans. Then you have Von Miller get injured. Like these are key. If you were to list the best players on the Bills defense, you would have both of those guys in everybody's top five easily. And now you're getting two of those back. Now we don't know if Vaughn's going to be back right away, but we know Micah, unless there's a setback, will be back right away. So I do think that that's, so, that has been such a calling card for the bills since going back to 2017, when they beat Atlanta the year after Atlanta went to the Super Bowl, and they were trying deep shots over the middle. And Micah Hyde was the ball Hawk in that game, getting the interceptions. Mm -hmm. And then at that point it was like, you were not beating the bills over the top regardless of who you have. And then you think of all of the moments where they've given up big plays in the years where they've had Poyer and Hyde. It's not shots over the top. It's crossing routes. It's stuff in the middle of the field where they just get mismatched. Like I think of the Tyree Kill touchdown in the 13-second game. That happens because they were so protecting getting beat over the top mm -hmm. that they took the underneath and it ultimately came and bit them in the butt. So yeah, I think getting Hyde back is huge. But to your point about Taylor Rapp, I don't think Taylor Rapp or Puna Ford sign here unless there's a path to them to be on the Playing field. Yep. Not all the time, but I don't think those guys are signing here to play 30% of snaps. I, I just don't. No, I, I, I hear you. And that's why I think it's super interesting. You know, going in, even after the draft, when the draft ended, all right, um, I guess I guess now they've only added Puna Ford since then. But when the draft ended, it's wild to think the Bills – had only added four defensive players the entire offseason. That's it. Mm -hmm. Zane Anderson, who they signed from the Chiefs practice squad at the end of the year because he wasn't given a futures contract by them. And then Taylor Rapp, their only free agent addition in free agency. And then the two draft picks that they mm -hmm. they they drafted on the defensive side of the ball, Dorian Williams and um, Alex Austin. So it's really interesting to me that that's all. But yet, here we are thinking about how they might look a lot different. By the way, speaking of Vaughn, Brandon Bean said, you know, 
he did not rule out Von Miller being ready for the season opener. And if you saw on, we are recording this on Thursday, on Thursday morning, I saw there was a video of Von working out. Holy mackerel. Like Mm -hmm. it's amazing. First of all, he's obviously Von Miller. He looks great, but man, he does not look like he is recovering from anything, let alone a torn ACL. He looked amazing in that video. Yeah, I saw the same video, and you're sitting there wondering, like, ooh, I wonder when this guy can get back out right. there. And I don't think there's any rush with a player of his caliber and a player of his experience. Like, right. I would Im- I would imagine we probably never see him on the field in Rochester for training camp. Agreed. But but why should we? Because, like, what does that guy really need to get caught up to speed on? So I think you just need to be extra caught. Ca- you know, you got to be extra cautious with kind of those situations, not to the level that the Bills were with Tredavious White necessarily, but – making sure that you don't rush him back because you're more worried right now about the games in November, December, and then beyond as opposed to the games in September and October. I I do think, and I'm not saying this to be a slight at Leslie Frazier at all, but I think after a while you need a fresh viewpoint. You need a change of philosophy. And I think that that will help them defensively. And I think Sean McDermott is now taking more of it and there's more pressure on him. And I love that. And I think that they are going, I I just think that there's something to be said about like my bread and butter is defense and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to coach this defense to be the best version of itself that it's been in a long time. And then offensively, it goes back to the Kincaid pick and some of the other pieces that they've added. I love that there needs to be a philosophy change. I would have been really irritated if they went into the season and just tried to do the same things that they did Mm -hmm. more efficiently. And they were never going to do that, but it feels like they've had a fundamental shift in what they are trying to do. And I still think, play the hits. I say this all the time about stuff. Josh Allen's got to be your best player on defense. You got to get after the quarterback and you got to get takeaways. Play the hits, but try new things because who knows what's going to hit. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we were having the conversation about Brian Dable and whether or not this offense was clicking to the level that it should have been. And then they all of a sudden had their hair on fire and then he became one of the hottest coaching candidates. And now he's the coach of the year and he led the Giants to the playoffs. So I think it's going to take Dorsey a little bit of time. Everybody's got to be a bit more patient there. And then defensively, let's see what you got, Sean. Now it's on you. Yeah, I... I love it. I agree with you about McDermott and taking the reins and putting it on him. Like there's pressure and he's, he's accepting the pressure and he's saying, put it on me. It's my defense. There's no one to point to. There's no, well, defensive coordinator and get rid of this guy or get rid of that guy. Yeah. You have assistant coaches, but guess what? This is on you now. And he's saying that and a coach going into his seventh year, who's come that close, who hasn't gotten to the ultimate goal where people feel that this team should. I think that's really interesting that he's willing and able and ready to accept that pressure and do it. And I think that puts even more pressure on him. I think there's also more pressure on Ken Dorsey now that he has these tools to work with and he has these toys, which we talked about before that I think to me, it's like a wish list of what he's wanted to do with tight ends. And now he's in year two. I think there's pressure on Ken Dorsey. This is a really, you could say the two coordinators which means Sean McDermott in this case, by the way, as a defensive coordinator, really do have quite a bit of pressure on them uh, going into a really important 2023. And and to wrap this up before we move on, isn't it funny how you just said fundamental shift? I agree with you. Defensive, fundamental shift maybe. We'll see. But it really revolves around the same thing, the middle of the field and controlling it. Middle linebacker, slot receiver with a tight end, and how the Bills feel that A – They've probably been taken advantage of by teams like Travis Kelsey and um, you go back to uh, uh, the um, who's the uh, the Bengals tight end last year when he scored yeah. the touchdown. Um, yeah, uh, escaping my name. Uh, but you go back to that. You go back to the last few years without Cole Beasley, mm-hmm. the middle of the field, right in that 10, 15 yard, maybe a little less middle of the field area is where it seems like both sides of the ball are concentrating on. Was it Hayden Hurst? Is that who we were talking about? Yes. Yes. So, and it's almost like a specific skill set because historically the Bills have done fairly well against opposing tight ends, but Mm -hmm. not against Travis Kelsey because he does not play like a traditional tight end, which is, I think, what they're trying to find with Dalton Kincaid. And, you know, I hate when people compare a player who has never played an NFL snap to somebody who's going to be maybe the best tight end of all time. But right. that's the mold. That's what you're ultimately working towards of somebody who can kind of fit in in that role. I think the middle of the field is a good point. I also just think it's the line of scrimmage. I think of getting Puna Ford, adding Connor McGovern, 
drafting Osiris Torrance, like getting better and more solidified on both lines. Because when I think of the Bengals game, I think of them not being able to take advantage of a really beat up line for the Bengals and getting taken advantage of by the Bengals defensive line. Like they lost that game right at the line of scrimmage. They also lost that game within like the first 10 minutes because at that point it was just over and the Bills didn't really have a chance of clawing back. So for me, that is the most promising sign from the off season, even though there wasn't any massive splash additions. I like Connor McGovern and Osiris Torrance and Puna Ford and what that does to all of the other people there, because I think it makes all of them better. Like Roger Saffold at one point in his career was a really good player. He made the Pro Bowl last year, which probably tells you what you need to know about the Pro Bowl. (laughs) But I think this is going to be a substantial upgrade with Connor McGovern. And if Osiris Torrance earns his way onto the field, then that's a really good problem to have because Ryan Bates is a pretty good starter. And if he's better than that, then so be it. That's great for the Bills. All right. We are one week away from the release of the NFL schedule. Matt, have you thought about what you want the schedule to look like? Is there anything that you really want from the schedule or don't want from the schedule yeah. in about a week when it's released? Yeah, I want 17 one o'clock Sunday Come afternoon on. games. Do you really? Do you really? Well, I, at a different point in my life, I I don't want to make it sound like I'm, you know, a dinosaur or anything at a different point in my life. I absolutely loved the primetime games and I Mm -hmm. loved the travel aspect. They are two things that I still really enjoy, but this season I'm going to try and have to figure out the balance between being a new father to a daughter who will be, I don't know, five months old at that point. And also enjoying the experiences on the road. So I would say, of all of the things that I'm looking for, I'm looking for more primetime games at home than on the road because it's a heck of a lot easier to cover a primetime game at home than it is to do it on the road. And I'm looking for a really nice bye week and a trip to Miami that's when the weather sucks here and it's not when it's still really nice here. Those are the three things that I'm immediately going to look for. Yeah, I would love to have... I, th- I want both Miami and LA late in the season for personal reasons. That's what we want. We want to go to the chargers mm-hmm. late in the season. You want to go to Miami late in the season. Let's get those warm weather games late in the season. Um, I was not on the Bills sidelines yet when max was born in December of 13, my first year was the next year. So he was less than a year old. My first mm-hmm. time as the bill sideline reporter and traveling with the team. I know exactly what you're going through, but I'm going to tell you this. You have a great wife and that's what it's all about, right? You guys support each other and you, you know that this is part of the job. And when you're home, you do everything you can to make sure she that can do her work. And when she's home, Mm -hmm. the same goes for you. So it'll, it'll turn out. Okay. It always is kind of fear. You you fear that like, Oh my God, you think about it. Do I need to be here? You feel guilty about it, but don't worry. You have a great wife and she's going to be there for you. I just want to say that. I just know that you appreciate it. Yeah. And, and so don't worry about it because I know she's going to be there to support you and not worry about and letting you do your job. That said, here's what I don't want from the schedule. I do not want the bills to play opening night at Kansas city. And no, I don't think they will, but Mike did, either. Mike did kind of leave that door open. Do you have a thought of who should be in that game or who will be in that game against the chiefs? I don't know if you have their home schedule in front of you, but I, you know, you have your traditional West opponents. You have the bills, you have the dolphins, you have the Bengals. Uh, oh no, they're, I think they're going to the bank. I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with a team that you didn't even say, hold on the bears, the lions. Oh, okay. Why the lions? Maybe I think they're trendy. I think that a lot of people loved watching the lions last year. I think that's a tougher game and it'll be a closer game than probably most people would anticipate it to be. The lions have made some additions in the off season. I think they're a trendy team and it goes back to the Mike North conversation you could kind of stick anybody there because people are going to watch it regardless. So why not stick the cool, trendy team there? Almost a reward for what they did last year, just missing it at the end, beating the Packers, the last regular season game of the year, keeping Aaron Rodgers out of the playoffs. I just think that that's one of the ways, it's like almost playing the middle. It's not a throwaway game by any stretch, but it also still saves all of the Chiefs' big-time opponents for slots in the season when the NFL would probably rather have those games showcased. I I made a mistake. The Bengals are actually at Kansas city this year. So maybe that could be one of them. I don't know, but like you said, that seems like it's too big of a game to put in that particular spot. I do think the dolphins are a juicy storyline with the return of Tyreek Hill. 
if that were the case, to go there on opening week. And I do think the Bears actually are the sneaky play here with Justin Fields. All right, so that said, um, I think we're both in agreement here that London is, is really trending to be maybe October 8. Maybe October 15, but October 8 seems like yeah. probably the date for London. There's been some stuff out there. People have Google searched mm-hmm. Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, even says Buffalo Bills on it for that date. Yeah. Still don't know the opponent. A lot of buzz. It could be Jacksonville playing back-to-back because the league wants to kind of have – you know, them stay out there, but I've also keep, I'm keep hearing the Raiders too, very much, much in the mix, including from people I know out in Vegas. I thought the Jags thing was a bit debunked by somebody on social media because they saw how the schedule was all put together and all of the different leaks. And they said it didn't make sense because Mm -hmm. they would have had to have played. That would mean they were going back to London twice in three weeks, as opposed to a back-to-back weeks. Now we don't know exactly what's going to happen at this point. These are all leaks. The only thing that I would feel more comfortable with saying is that, yeah, October 8th seems like the date that it's probably going to be because of all the different information that's out there. And yeah, who knows who it's going to be. I also don't really think the opponent matters for the bills fans that are making the trip. Like I don't think think it matters if people do not want to lose a division game here. Right. Well, Yes. But that wouldn't deter you from going on the trip. That would also make it maybe even more likely Good point. Good point. that you would right. go on the trip. So Good point. yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I. I don't think that the opponent there is the biggest thing. I guess the biggest questions that I have are: Where are the primetime games? Are they on Black Friday? Going back to our conversation with Mike North, and then who do they start the season against? We were having the conversation at the draft. It was the two of us. I think it was John Scott. It might have been Josh Reed. We were talking about, doesn't it feel like Bills at Jets on like Sunday night football could be the perfect way to start the season for both of those teams? Well, you kind of stole my thunder. I'm going to make it. No, that's okay. No, no, no. Because you're right. So maybe you feel the same way. That's my prediction. I do think the Bills are going to open at the Jets on Sunday night football. Maybe it's in Buffalo. But I think Bills Jets Sunday night football, maybe Monday night. It's a prime time week one game. I think that is how the Bills open their season. Prime time against the Jets. And that would be. A real doozy, obviously, with – should you say doozy? I don't even know if that's a word anymore people use. You can, but You can say it. Okay, well, that's hot, right? I mean, Aaron Rodgers, his first game, Bills, Jets. Matt, I did a mock schedule. I'm going to show it to you on my screen. Are you ready? Here yeah, you go. I love this. It's on my notes. It's on my notes in my – now, the only thing I have an, an issue with here is I only have them playing – I got them Sunday, Monday, Sunday. Oh, no, no. I got one, two, three, four, five primetime games and a London game. Yep. Only one home primetime game. Here's what I have. You ready? Hold on. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Can you can you see it on your Yeah, so I see go? Jets on Sunday Night Football week 1. Do you want me to like go through it and read it or I have you- yeah, I, it, it's tough for me to it's tough for people to see it maybe because of the the glare, but it what is. I have is Jets on Sunday Night week 1, followed by the Giants at home, followed by the Broncos at home. Two home games. Then you go to the Commanders then London against the Raiders and then coming home another home game against the Buccaneers because I don't think the Bills will want to um, give up their bye week that early. And then I have them going to the Chiefs on Monday night football in week number seven. Well, I think you would probably take that beginning of the schedule besides the Jets game is, I don't want to say favorite, like, you would feel pretty comfortable. Remember at the beginning of last year, how we talked about you had to get through those first seven weeks and that was like kind of the stretch of death. It feels like this is almost the reversal to that. The Chiefs would be the thing at the ends, the bookend of that. But Mm -hmm. besides the Jets on the road, if that's what it is, you're probably favored. You're probably favored in all of those games up until Kansas City. But the Jets game might be like, minus one and a half or minus two and a half or something like that. I think the other games you would be favored by probably a touchdown or so. And we're just playing around here. I have no idea. This is literally me making it up. But what would you think about something like this, which is let's take a look at it again. I'm going to try to put it up for you to, to see a little bit better. I have the dolphins here in Buffalo on a Monday night. Uh-huh. I have uh, once again, trying to get the, so it's not as fuzzy for everybody. There we go. Then, at, Hey, I got LA a little bit later that at Patriots jets at home. Eagles on a Thursday night. Yeah. Cowboys at home. Honestly, Matt, I got the Bengals on a Monday night because I feel the league might say, look, I think we want to have that again because that was the group that was there. Everybody that was with DeMar, what happened, the yeah. announcing crew, all that. And that Patriots game I have week 17, that would be one of those Saturday possible flex games here in Buffalo. 
Okay. Do you have on this schedule, because it doesn't say it anywhere in particular, is this accounting for a Black Friday game? Or is this no, not they would a Black, not Friday, Black game? Friday Black Friday week would be, uh, Thanksgiving week would be week 12. I have them at the Patriots on a normal Sunday. Okay. Interesting. Is that missing a game? Or is that everything? No, that's 18. That's a bye at week okay. eight. Yeah. I, I don't know. Weeks. I I think that I think that they're gonna get two home primetime games and then they'll get three or four on the road. But I think it'll be less home games. And I would say the leader in the clubhouse is maybe like who would be the most attractive home primetime opponent? Is it the Cowboys or is it a division game? Maybe Giants, Cowboys with Dable, but yeah. I think Giants would be real attractive. I probably Cowboys just because it's Cowboys. It's what happened on Monday night years ago here against Dallas on Monday night. Yeah. Um, and then besides that, I would say probably Miami. Miami makes a lot of, at least at home, Miami makes a lot of sense with the way those two teams have played. All right. So yeah, let's, let's predict. We both agree then week one jets prime time, right? I, I think Prediction, the, if, I, if I said you had to make a call, what do you think it is? I think I would say jets, but my backup would be Bengals. On the okay. road, on like Monday Night Football. Who are you calling week 18? It's got to be a division game. Um, anyway. I'm actually going to not say New England this year. I'm going to say the Jets, and it's going to bookend the beginning okay. and the end, both with the Jets. I could see that playing out. I have them at the Dolphins like the year they broke the playoff drought, mm -hmm. going there the final week of the season, because I think Mike kind of gave us a clue that maybe they'll flip-flop how those games are played this year and where they're played, mm -hmm. like at what time of the season in Buffalo and in Miami. Yeah. So – when That's did you me. have when did you have on your mock little schedule them going to New England? Uh, I have them at New England Thanksgiving week on a normal Sunday. Thanksgiving okay. weekend though. Oh, I would love that. Oh, that would be delightful. The weather yeah. would still be nice. Wouldn't yep. have to miss Thanksgiving. So you want me to leave. just submit this to Mike North and say, please give us this schedule. This is good for everybody, right? Just, you want me to do that? Just text that. And when is the in the Miami is the end of the year, the last week at in Miami. LA was LA when, was uh early November. Great. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Sounds incredible. And when was the bye week? On the bye your week schedule? Eight. It's week eight. Oh, it's perfect, my gosh. Right? You, know what, you know what I'm going to do? I'm I just created make... the perfect bill schedule for you, Matt Bove. I'll make a mock schedule as well. And just, you know what I'll do? <laughs> I'll make a mock schedule and I'll send it to you. Or we'll post them side by side with each other and say, whose schedule do you like better? And we'll post it and we'll let everybody else pick and see what they like. Because I... All right. I mean, I, I've said it before. I am a schedule nerd. Yes, I me too. I love am it. Fascinated by the schedule. I think it's awesome. You know, um, we have for years, Mike Schopen and I, years and years, we've always kind of tried to predict all of the primetime games early in the season. He's a schedule nerd. And the way Mike explains it, and I agree, and I think you're the same way. I think you're a schedule nerd because you probably like puzzles, right? It's a puzzle. That's what it is. It's mm -hmm. a puzzle to put things together where you know they got to go somewhere. So where do you fit it in? I think that's what's cool about trying to be uh, the, the schedule. I've seen people go, "Who cares? We're all going to know in a week anyway." Well, I care. Yeah, I want to know. I I, I I think it's fun to try and figure it out. My father-in-law is the same way, and he tells me all the time it's like one of his favorite days of the year. And what he does, because you know he's a little bit older, so he doesn't have to like immediately find out on his smartphone what's happening. Yeah. He yeah. takes a piece of paper. And he goes down his computer and goes one by one and slowly <laughs> reveals every single game. And he takes down a little tally of like, it's like Howard picking the bills, but it's yes. Blaze, but it's Blaze picking the bills. And he slowly yes. goes down and just goes one at a time. And I'm like, yeah, that's so he doesn't even want to. I mean, we've had the conversation. Usually I'll have a pretty good idea what the schedule looks like a couple yep. hours before he's like, do not tell me. He's like, don't ruin this for me. Oh, I want to yeah. find out. I want to find out at eight o'clock on leaks. Thursday night. I don't love the leaks, but I got to, we got to, it's part of our job kind of stay on top oh, of it. Right? I love it because it goes back to the puzzle thing. It yes. lets me piece everything together. Uh, so okay. I see the leaks and I go, okay, well, All that right. means in week eight, they got to be able to play the Broncos, the Raiders or the Jags. And then you try and figure out all the stuff. That is a fun day. Last year, actually schedule release day. I think you were there. It was Oak Hill PGA Championship Media Day in Rochester. So oh. in that day, we found out Bills, Bills against Rams, and that which we kind of 
already knew. It was some, I remember us having the conversation literally like before it happened. Right. Um, and then the actual schedule itself. But I remember driving back from Rochester and I think I was listening to GR and it was literally just, all right, this is the reported leak for week 14. And this is the reported <laughs> leak for 12. And you're sitting there trying to like take it all in. It was, it was awesome. It's going to be fun again this year. All right, you do that. Come up with a mock schedule. Yep. We'll tweet both of ours out to see which one people like better or feel better about for the Bills. The other last point I'll make on the schedule, it's it's not just us who want to like go to these warm places. I am very good friends with the Buccaneers sideline reporter, TJ Reeves. He comes on my show quite a bit, the Extra Point Show with myself and Joe. He says, like, just don't give us Buffalo in December. <laughs> like that, that's yeah. what they say down there. Don't give us Buffalo in December. They're looking at the schedule going, please don't do that. Well, it's also fans. So many fans yeah. now make these trips to go to these games that they want to escape the bitter cold yep. of a December in Buffalo to go to Florida more than they want to have to get in their car and drive to Cincinnati. Like, yeah, that's an easy trip to make compared to some of the other ones, but you want to go to those warm places if you're planning on doing that trip when the weather isn't great here. So that's why, I mean, I know a lot of people always say like, oh, you know, we'll find out the schedule at the same time. Why do people care? Well, a lot of people's travel and their yes. plans di are dictated by the schedule. A lot of people, uh, you, if, if, I mean, it's probably the same for you. The London game, so many people are trying to figure out exactly when the game is because they want to know, are they going before? Yeah. Are they going after? Is the game the beginning of their trip? Is it the end of their trip? What do they have to do? Is it going to be a bye week if they're a season ticket holder? Like, are, what are they doing the week before or the week after? So it dictates a lot of people's lives probably more so than it should, but, but that's the reality of it. All right, last thing before we head out of here. Uh, we'd be remiss not to mention real quickly today – that we are doing this May the 4th be with you, by the way, May 4th, right yeah. today, final vote coming on the bills, new stadium, which we are expecting to pass, but that will be, that will be it. It'll be over. It'll be done. And then groundbreaking shortly after that, let's get this thing done, Matt. Yeah, no kidding. Every time they need a new flag. If you're listening to this Bills staff, anybody who's in the front office, the flag was ripped at the new oh. middle 50 yard line, right. the one on the other side of the road. So they need a new flag. I'm just excited for this process to play out. This is something that's one of those moments for me. I've never covered anything around a new stadium or seen oh. a new stadium be built. I, I've never been around for any of that. The arena was going up when I was six years old so i didn't see that i don't remember up when i was living in florida i don't remember it so i don't remember any of that i do remember kind of all the buzz around harbor center and going in there while that was being built because that's when i was pretty early on at channel seven and you're like wow this is really cool and you know i know there's so many layers to the stadium conversation but i think it's going to be very cool to see that kind of be built quite literally from the ground up and see the progress that is made every week every month every year as we get closer to ultimately the them moving into the new stadium next time we talk to you hopefully we'll have a date for groundbreaking either or even if we don't though we at least can say that's it it's done it's over it's happening the bill's new stadium which we expect to be happening and to be able to tell you all right for matt bove i'm sal capaccio thank you very much to lucas buckley as always for producing the program here both audio and video check us yep. out itunes spotify wgr app uh, odyssey app and, of course, on the YouTube channel, at Sell Sports as well, if you want to see our smiling faces. Thanks a lot, Matt. Have a uh, great day, great week, great weekend. And who knows, maybe we'll have a surprise you know, podcast if something big happens with the Bills. For sure.